so as uh, Rachel mentioned, I'm the uh, co-director of the Brain Tumor Center, and I, most of uh, what I focus on treating patients is in neuro-oncology, which is uh, the practice of treating patients with brain tumors. Oh, sure. So most of what I uh, practice on is in neuro-oncology, which means uh, treating patients with brain tumors. Um, I am also a neurologist, and I do attend on the inpatient neurology service here at NYU uh, a few weeks a year. And so I do see a, a, a number of general neurology patients. Uh, so today, the, what we were going to talk about is both general brain health, um, ultimately brain tumors, uh, which is what I specialize in, is... Uh, um, relatively rare in general and very rare if you uh, take the whole scope of brain diseases and neurological diseases. If you take all the malignant brain cancers together, uh, they're still classified as a rare cancer by the CDC or the Centers for Disease Control. Um, but as, as many of you are well aware, brain diseases in general, which I'll talk about, uh, afflicts far more many, uh, far many uh, more people in the, the United States than brain cancers. So. We thought we'd start with a general overview about brain health, uh, what that means, and um, how that could impact you, and what you can do. Um, and then we'll uh, move into a talk about brain tumors in general. So um, when I say that brain health, uh, brain problems encompass a, uh, far more people than brain tumors and uh, um, afflict many people in the United States, uh, there are really several very common brain diseases that, that we see in general neurology, the most common of them being stroke. So stroke is probably something that you've all heard about and maybe uh, has afflicted many of your uh, family members, loved ones, or friends. Um, so I'll talk about stroke, which is very common. Um, the other uh, thing that I think many of you are aware of and um, probably have had some impact on your life, whether your friends, family, or yourself, is cognitive impairment. Cognitive means essentially thinking, it's a simple way of uh, saying thinking, which includes memory, uh, your language, um, processing things, multitasking, things like that. And another common brain disease, which I won't talk as much about, it, or really much about in general, because even in the scale of all brain uh, diseases, movement disorders, although uh, more common than brain tumors, is relatively uncommon when you, uh, when you compare it to stroke and, and cognitive impairment. So with regards to these diseases, and again, I think when you talk about brain health, the, th uh, the th diseases that impact the brain, about 90% of what we see in general neurology are going to be stroke, essentially. So um, although we may be worried about Parkinson's disease or MS or some other, or a brain tumor, which are all relatively rare, the much more common disease that may afflict us is, is stroke. And what is stroke? So stroke means that there's been a problem with the blood vessels in the brain so either a blood clot and what you see here is is an mri picture of a brain that has had a blood clot in a brain and then um, there's no more blood flow through that blood vessel and then the brain that that blood vessel supplies becomes damaged and here you see that all, uh, what's lighting up in white uh, is is areas of brain that have been damaged by that blood clot okay um, on the other hand, blood uh, vessel problems can also be bleeds, so damage to the blood vessel that causes leakage of blood into the brain. And the bleeds can also, so here's a CAT scan uh, of a person with a bleed in their brain, and this very bright circular sort of or egg-shaped lesion is, is an acute, we call it, we say it, it's acute, so basically it's a sudden bleed that happened in the brain. And so uh, stroke really encompasses both generally these, these type of problems. These are quite common. On the general neurology service, again, about 90% of the patients that we see in the hospital that get hospitalized uh, with any kind of brain disease are patients with stroke, one of these two. Um, and, and so what causes these? What are they? And, and, and what are the symptoms? And the symptoms are really key. If you're going to be uh, want to prevent as much uh, problems or damage to yourself or, or to your friends, uh, then the most important thing is to look out for the signs and symptoms of stroke. And this is something that you may or may not have heard from your colleagues, uh, friends, and other uh, family members. So what a stroke manifests as, how it, how it arises, it is really about the timing. It's a sudden problem, so people are fine, and then all of a sudden you see them just start doing something. And then that something, that suddenness, is, is what really uh, makes us think about a stroke. And then the other key word is focal. And when we say focal, 
uh, we mean that there's just one part of the body or one side of the body that gets affected, not that people just collapse and faint, um, and not that uh, uh, both arms and legs start shaking at once. That's another problem that's called a seizure. But if it's just one side, let's say their face droops suddenly and their arm doesn't move or they just become really clumsy and you really see it's just one side or one part of the body and it happens like that, just extremely suddenly, that's a sign of a stroke. Um, and other, so, so I've laid, left some examples that are fairly common symptoms of strokes. So a facial droop, slurred speech, they're talking normally, then a little, they just start slurring their words. Garbled speech, unable to speak. So you're having a conversation and all of a sudden they can't get any of their words out. Um, uh, One-sided weakness, left, right, arm, leg, or both right arm and leg, or both left arm and leg. Um, vision problems, they seem to be having problems, suddenly a person seems to be having problems seeing on one side or another, they're suddenly bumping into things on their right side, um, or, or not noticing you on one side and then only paying attention to the other. And then sudden confusion, so, uh, and which and these are quite vague, but these are the warning signs. Um, it, confusion is a little bit vague. A lot of things can cause sudden confusion, but if it persists and lasts for you know, more than a few seconds or a few, uh, 30 seconds or a minute, it's something to be concerned about. And the, and the issue is when you see something that really concerns you that might be a stroke, then really the, the main thing is, is, is to call for help. If you can call an ambulance, call it right, call it right away. All right? And the reason being is we've, come to, we've had this term now uh, over the past 10, 15 years of uh, uh, something in the medical field we call as time is brain. Um, and the reason being is like when you had a stroke, when you have a blood clot and the blood is not getting to that part of the brain, the longer that the blood doesn't get to that part of the brain, the more and more damage it does. And there are ways, we do have treatments now, if someone has a stroke, and has a sudden problem and they get to the hospital, we do have treatments that are proven now to improve their outcome, improve their post-stroke outcome. And so we think time is brain and really as soon as you, as you can, even up to uh, 24 hours later, there's still poten potentially things that we can do to help that person who we think has had a stroke. Um, one acronym that you might have seen even on TV that, uh, we're start uh, that people are starting to pub publicize in pamphlets and things like that, is something called FAST. So, you know, act fast is essentially what they're trying to say. F for facial droop, A for arm weakness, because these are the, if you're gonna have a stroke, these are some of the most common symptoms of a stroke. Sudden facial droop, sudden A for arm weakness, sudden speech difficulties, and these could be sudden slurring of speech or uh, unable to get their words out. And then T is the time again, right? Time is brain, call an ambulance right away, get them to the hospital. Um, they need imaging and potentially treatment for, for their condition. Um, and so, so those are the things to look, to look for. So, you know, now that I, you know, probably put some fear into some of you, what can you do now to try to prevent a stroke, okay? Um, again, this is a very, stroke is a very common disease. Of all the brain diseases that we see, stroke is by far the most common. And um, there are uh, the really very clearly four major risk factors uh, for people to have a stroke. And well, there's actually five, and I'm not gonna list that because um, there's, there's four that we can do something about and five we really can't. And the fifth one is age, all right? I didn't list that here, but essentially every decade of life, all of our risk of stroke increases with every decade of life, but that's not something that we can change. Um, the other things we can potentially change are things like diabetes, or, or, or manage, I should say. Diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and smoking. All right, all of these are directly related to the risk of, of, of stroke. So it's almost an algorithm, meaning if someone comes in and has a stroke um, or suspect a stroke and we really go through this list and the, the more of these things they have, the more likely they'll have had a stroke. And also, um, and we're looking, we always look for why a person's had a stroke. And basically, um, you know, when, we think of, when we look for reasons for why we have a stroke, then we look at these four factors. Do they have diabetes? Do they have high blood pressure? Do they have high cholesterol? Do they, are they smokers? Then if, if you check off all of those, four of those boxes, there's almost no other, uh, nothing else that we really need to do to figure out what happened, okay? Um, so uh, what can you do? So you know that these are the risk factors, so we can't change that you know, we're gonna get older. Everyone so um, uh, what can you do to prevent the, essentially the most common brain disease we have? Number one is 
is to quit smoking, really. And then you can quit smoking at any age. You can be 68, and if you quit smoking, there's actually been demonstrated benefits to that even later. Um, smoking, stroke is not the only uh, risk factor uh, disease that smoking causes, but smoking is clearly a risk factor for, for uh, uh, stroke. All right, as, uh, where was I? Smoking, okay. And then the other things that I mentioned that you can potentially control, so how do you do that? Um, so things like your blood pressure, cholesterol, and diabetes. Um, you know, we don't know exactly what causes all of these all of the just been time. Oh, there you go. That goes to the it. Perfect. Thanks. So we don't have all the answers for why someone gets diabetes or why someone gets blood pre uh, high blood pressure at a certain age uh, versus others. But these are manageable conditions, um, sometimes <laughs> with uh, things that you can do without taking medications and sometimes you, uh, uh, you have to take medications and you can control them. So these are manageable. Um, things that you can do without taking medications is, is, is eating a heart healthy diet. And I'll go over that in, in a slide or two uh, eventually uh, next. But um, what's really been shown um, it, to decrease uh, uh, the, the impact of these risk factors is uh, essentially living a healthy lifestyle, what you might imagine as, as a healthy lifestyle. So more physical activity, essentially, right? So it doesn't mean that you have to go, you know, train for the half marathon, all right, or go to the gym four times a week and spend an hour on, you know, the, the machine. It's just, it's really about increasing your physical activity, walking more. It, walking 20 minutes a day, or walking 20 minutes even three times a week. These there's there are studies that, that that assess that versus just you know your uh, relatively sedentary lifestyle. We we are getting more and more sedentary uh, as the years go on due to you know basically things that we can order online, sit, sit in front of our computer, have things delivered up to us. So we're getting more and more sedentary. Now there's studies that are showing that just increasing your physical activity decreases your risk for a lot of things. And one of the things that it can do is improve things like your blood pressure um, and and uh, improve uh, the blood sugar control in patients with diabetes, things like that. So if you just live a healthy lifestyle or if you think that you're not doing as much as you should, uh, uh, strive to live a healthier lifestyle and that means eating a healthy diet and increasing your physical activity, you can have a better control of your uh, stroke risk factors, right? That's what we call them. The other thing is, um, you know, when we have patients with stroke, we look, we assess their blood pressure, their cholesterol levels, um, and uh, your, their blood sugars and things like that. And if it's clear that they need medications, we prescribe them. And then these medications, uh, there's reasonable evidence that these medications that control blood pressure, cholesterol, and diabetes will lower your risk of stroke. Now, on the other hand, um, all of these you might have, have, have heard about. Um, and more commonly associated with things like heart disease, right, having a heart attack. So not only will the benefit of controlling these risk factors decrease your risk of stroke, you'll have the simultaneous benefit of improving your overall heart health as well too. So, uh, but basically, again, the heart health uh, is, is uh, associated with your blood vessels and so is uh, your brain health, okay? So, um, and, and again, when, we, when their doctor prescribes medications, um, usually, and if it's for these conditions, uh, you should follow your doctor's advice and ask questions. If you, if you feel like that you, you, you know, certain things you, you may or may not need to be taken, you ask your doctor questions. Now, the one actual preventative medications aimed just at stroke that's is still shown to be the most effective uh, for patients who've had a stroke is, is an aspirin, a baby aspirin. So, but it's not, an aspirin is not for everyone. It's something that you, you should ask your doctor whether or not that's something that you should take. But for people who have had a stroke and want to prevent another one, um, given the conditions, aside from controlling all these other measures, it's taking a baby aspirin has been shown to prevent uh, uh, your risk of getting another stroke later on down the line. Um, so these are some of the measures that you can take. Um, and, 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 and ultimately, that's uh, uh, what, I'll, what I'll say about stroke. And again, um, by far the most common disease that we see uh, in patients that are hospitalized and in general in our outpatient neurology cl uh, clinics. So uh, I'll move on to the sort of second general topic I'll talk about in, in terms of brain health, and that's cognitive and thinking, uh, cognitive impairment. So cognitive meaning thinking. And again, to just rehash thinking, cognition, is essentially uh, uh, who we are and how we think. So cognition can range from math skills, language, at paying attention, you know, sort of being focused, multitasking. Um, so, uh, so 
uh, again, cognition, um, the classic thing I think people think about is memory loss. Um, and, and that's certainly true, but uh, memory loss is just one aspect of your, uh, memory is one aspect of your cognition. Again, it's math skills, visual, spatial skills, creativity, sort of your motivation to do things. All of these things are, are, are impacted, uh, are grouped into cognition. And when you think about um, diseases that might impact your memory and cognition, what really I think a lot of people um, uh, associate that with and are worried about is Alzheimer's disease or Alzheimer's <laughs> dementia. Um, now, on the other hand, as a consultant neurologist, when even other doctors ask us to assess a patient with memory loss, what I can tell you is also much more common, and not just much more common, but potentially things that we can actually try to do something about are highlighted here in blue, okay? And so when we see a patient that um, someone, either the patient's family uh, gets referred to us either by themselves or uh, through a family member or even through another doctor and the main complaint is a cognitive difficulty or uh, um, memory loss, as a consultant neurologist we think about all of these other things essentially first because they are more common, number one. And, and secondly, uh, they, there some of these things we can really do something about okay, uh, and, and try to really significantly improve. So um, medical conditions and, and vitamin deficiency is a very general term, but uh, you might not realize it, but there are certain things like hormone deficiencies, uh, vitamin deficiencies that actually can manifest as like a dementia syndrome, dementia meaning memory and cognitive impairment. And um, we can screen for these. We can do uh, tests for your hormones. We can do tests for uh, vitamins. And sometimes we do find that patients have low levels of, of certain things and we can just supplement it and patients do improve, okay? Um, excessive alcohol, that's actually, it, there's actually a syndrome that we have in medicine that um, leads to essentially a cognitive impairment that's very much like an, uh, Alzheimer's. And excessive meaning not like one drink or a, a, you know, a, a, a glass of wine uh, in the evening, people that drink heavily and excessively and, and it's something that you know, doctors will, will talk about and it can lead to a dementia type syndrome. Medications, this is actually quite common, it's particularly in older people. Um, you know, the, the family members bring them in, say they're incredibly confused, and uh, you know, they're really, you know, they've been confused for the past couple of months, and um, you know, it seems to fluctuate, and they're really worried that something else is going on. And then, um, what I, after doing a, a little bit more history taking, I get answer, uh, getting some questions answered, I found out that the patient's taking new drugs, so uh, pain medications, um, other even blood pressure medications that can lead to drowsiness and um, things like inattention, inattention being like that we can't focus, things like that. And then basically by just by switching up medications or having them hold one or switching to something else, they improve, okay? Um, that's actually something that we, I always check. The first thing I check often when I, when I get a consult on a patient um, who has uh, difficulty with cognition is I go through their medication list. Um, depression, actually, of all of these things is particularly in older people. Um, of all of these things in blue, um, probably the first or second most common reason that for the consult of memory loss and uh, poor cognition is really depression. Depression is incredibly common, getting more common as we unfortunately get more isolated as a society as we're kind of all stuck on our phones and, and, and iPads uh, and, and stuck online. Depression, um, it, it, which is getting much more common, uh, can afflict older people much more heavily than even younger people and can lead to something like a memory loss syndrome. When people get depressed, they can't focus on anything. They can't focus on the task at hand. They can't focus on what they're reading. Uh, they don't listen and pay attention to the, what uh, people are telling them. And because they really have such an emotional depression that's really impacting their ability to retain that information, and then they forget. And then it comes out as, I'm forgetting what people told me, I'm forgetting what um, uh, someone had said, and their family members will say that, that, you know, that, that uh, they don't remember anything I tell them. And when you do the screening, you, see, you find someone that's very depressed. So of all of these things in blue um, that are not Alzheimer's, yep. So for the treatment of depression, I, I know I've heard of CBT recommended for that, for memory loss, but does it have to be CBT or do different types of treatments, therapies work the same? Yeah, they're very different types of treatments. And then depression is, yeah, so depression is not one disease as well. Uh, depression is a very general term. There's definitely different types of depression. 
screened by psychiatrists. I think primary care physicians do an initially good job and neurologists can do an initially good job at identifying a depression syndrome. But really, I think an effective therapy, if it's depression that's really impacting their functioning and memory, I think they should be referred to a psychologist or a psychiatrist who then can identify what type of depression they have and, uh, and do the appropriate treatment, whether it's, med whether it's medical or something like cognitive behavioral therapy or another type of therapy. Um, another thing, particularly in young people, when I see people that uh, I get consults for memory loss, um, and if they're young and also maybe a little bit heavier set or just have, have a thick sort of body habit, is I think about whether they're sleeping well. And, and sleeping well, and, and the direct reason is something like obstructive sleep apnea, something that you may have heard about, um, where basically people go to sleep and then they go through periods where they're just not breathing while they're asleep. And that obstructive sleep apnea, even though they might actually be in bed for eight hours, they're actually only getting a very small amount of quality, quality sleep. And that affects your brain. When you're awake in the morning, people, you know, they just haven't slept enough. It impacts their memory, impacts their uh, uh, motivation, impacts their ability to do many different things. So I always ask about their sleep ha habits as well, too. Um, and it's not just obstructive sleep apnea that can cause these memory uh, issues. And then the, probably, again, in the top two in terms of uh, memory loss is, the, is something called multi-infarct dementia. Do you have a question? Yeah, I can see um, I is it hereditary? Is what hereditary? My mother is 96. Mm -hmm. And she's starting to have memory. Mm -hmm. um, but she's been harder to, to deal with these days. Um, is it hereditary? Well, we'll go to that back to that in a second. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you're asking if Alzheimer's I'm disease is hereditary. She has a memory loss. Yeah. Uh, is it hereditary? So I, I don't know. So I don't know because I don't know exactly what kind of memory loss your mother has. So she is 93, right? 90. And yeah, these, this is, or, or in her 90s, this in, the point being is this entire list here has to be screened for, and that's usually what a, a good neurologist will screen for to figure out, is it another medical condition? Is that she had strokes? Is uh, no, she she's, she exactly. So, yeah, so exactly. these are, so the point being is we'd have to figure out exactly why she's having memory loss. And then, fi then once you figure out why they have memory loss, then you can uh, start to answer those questions. Small strokes, is that what they refer to? Yeah, so memory? exactly. Multi-infarct dementia, which is incredibly, well, from a neurologist's perspective, is very common. I'd say it's up in the top one or two of the things that cause memory loss. So these are t uh, multi-infarct dementia. Infarct is another word for a stroke. And, um, and these are tiny little strokes that happen, and many, many people don't even know that they're having them. But they accumulate, and then once they accumulate, they can start impacting your memory and other thinking uh, processes. Um, and that's... Okay. So who does? So, we'll, so maybe I'll take one more, and then I'll, I'll yeah. reserve the questions. After for all the ladies spoke. Yeah. <laughs> You're the last one. Very last one. And then we'll have time at the end. I just want to make sure there's enough time for yeah. presentations. So I want to ask you, in regard to the depression, mm -hmm. can plaque collecting on the brain, you know, I know like things like turmeric and, and uh, pepper helps with the unclogging and maybe some of the stripping, and things like um, advanced artery solution where it's a, a chemical, I guess, that also strips the plaque. Mm -hmm. Can that, I don't know if that works, so I'm asking mm -hmm. you that too. And the second part I wanted to ask you was, does that plaque collection, could it lead to depression? Um, so depression, we think, is a, so the plaque, I believe what you're asking about is maybe uh, what we see in the bottom of the list, which is Alzheimer's type dementia and some of these other uh, really true dementia syndromes. Um, and uh, uh, that's getting a, a little bit uh, deep into what the literature is discussing with regards to plaque and the cause of dementia and whether or not getting rid of the plaque improves dementia. So what I can tell you is that you know the things that you're mentioning, which are sounds like you know naturopathic or supplements, it's not clear even with the medications and the research that we have that are um, uh, de developed by medical institutions and drug companies uh, that we're able to clear the plaque even with those, and also whether or not that plaque is truly the primary cause of, of these de of, of dementia. And All right. Depression? So depression is a different disease. Okay. It's a totally different disease. So then, uh, again, to go not, uh, away from the blue and into the black here, which is uh, things that are not associated with other 
problems, medical conditions, but actually brain, the brain itself. Um, in general, the, the common things that we see is, number one, something called mild cognitive impairment, and meaning, what that means is that people are having problems, whether it's memory or some other part of your cognition, but they don't quite fit the criteria for having something like Alzheimer's disease. And then there's true Alzheimer's disease, all right? And then I'll talk a little bit about um, the, the, these, these now. So what is multi-infarct dementia? I was, and that was your question, is it tiny little strokes? See all these little white spots along the brain. These are all tiny little strokes, in, and at the end of the day, these are many hundreds of tiny little strokes that people, most of them, the vast majority of people aren't even aware of um, while they're happening. Um, occasionally, people might have a TIA. A TIA is like a transient stroke, where you might have a facial droop that lasts for a half hour and then gets better. Um, that we think is either just a tiny little stroke that got better, or maybe didn't fully evolve into a true stroke, but it almost was a stroke. But the bottom line is those things end up causing tiny, tiny little injuries to the brain, and that accumulates, and that can cause a multi-infarct dementia. And again, this is really a stroke syndrome, so it really goes back to the first part of the lecture where really the goal here is to prevent strokes, right? And then you can take your own measures, and you can take medical measures. And that's, again, things like smoking, diabetes, blood pressure, uh, and, and uh, cholesterol. Um, and then what we get into is something called Alzheimer's disease, and Alzheimer's disease is what we call a degenerative syndrome, meaning the parts of the brain degenerate. There's parts of the brain that essentially shrink. And as they shrink, um, that part of the brain that controls, uh, that's controlling that certain function, whether it's memory or other parts, uh, starts to be become impaired, all right? And there's one example of it, a classic area that shrinks, um, these little almond-shaped nuggets here, um, in, in, the, in the brain, so this is the brain kind of from your, your uh, 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 it's, it's as if you're looking through the brain and then sort of slicing it through the middle, looking at a person. Um, what you see here is this is the same area as this. So this is a normal brain and this is someone with Alzheimer's disease and you can see it's really markedly shrunken compared to the normal brain. We don't 100% know in most common types of uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease what the ultimate cause is. What we do know is it does shrink. Um, and that leads to the impairment, okay? And there's an enormous body of literature in, term, in uh, looking at why that happens and can we prevent it, all right? And also, who's at risk for it, all right? So maybe uh, go that, into that a little bit, but what I want to tell you first is just sort of what, what are those signs, and I actually did already mention some of them, but some things that you can look for, out for yourself or, or more commonly in, in your family and friends um, and loved ones is what kind of questions should you be asking um, either yourself or the patient. These are the questions that I ask when someone comes in with memory impairment or their family member tells them that they uh, comes in and says they have memory impairment. Um, these are the questions I ask them. I mean, is your, have you noticed that they've had more problems lately finding their words, um, particularly people's names, more so than they did even just a year or two ago? Um, they seem to be repeating the question over and over and over again. They ask you something and then they go in another room, come back, ask you the same thing. And then that happens constantly throughout the day. Um, you, let's say someone knows how to get to a certain place that they've gone to the past 30 years and just walked like seven blocks away. Um, and then suddenly start, they start forgetting how to get there. That's a clear sign. Um, getting lost, getting to a place they typically go to. Um, and then uh, normal daily tasks is somewhat of the same thing, but let's say someone has a set routine and starts to deviate from that set routine. Um, judgment, uh, and then another thing is loss of spontaneity. So you know, people might be highly motivated people. They like to go up and get, uh, go for walks, go to get coffee, and then more recently over the past couple of months, you've noticed they just don't want to go. They just sit around and they're not interested. Um, there are some people, they, one of the signs is that they're, they're, they, they take the care of the bills every month, they write the checks, um, and then suddenly, you know, or over time, they've noticed over the past few months, they've started to make more mistakes, or they stop writing them all together. Um, a clear one is losing things like keys and things like that, and leaving them in odd places. Um, and then the last one, which some people might not uh, you know, think about as cognition, is personality change. They become a little bit more labile, maybe perhaps more aggressive, um, uh, more anxiety, uh, things like that, and that can happen. That can be a sign of, of, of uh, 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 cognitive impairment. 
um, what, what measures you can take. So this goes into, again, so then what can we do about it? What is it and what can we do about it? So it's a huge body of literature that I can tell you has not been clearly, you know, wish we knew exactly what caused Alzheimer's in most people and um, I wish we knew exactly how to prevent Alzheimer's in most people. Um, again, it has been a decade of top-level research getting to the answers of some of these. Now, what I can tell, if you go to the summary guidelines from the National uh, Institutes of Health, um, what they can tell you, what they do tell you, actually, um, if Alzheimer's is a thing, so there's all those other more common things that I actually mentioned that are medical conditions, but if it's Alzheimer's you're worried about, there actually isn't anything absolutely with enough good evidence that the National Institute of Health is going to recommend that everyone do, okay? Whether it's Sudoku or any of those other games that you see on TV that they tell you to buy or any other specific living habits, there's not enough evidence for any one measure that the, the NIH will come out and say this is what everyone should be doing to prevent uh, uh, dementia, okay? Now on the other hand, there have been some studies that suggest some things over others and with some things that have little harm but also health benefits to other things like stroke, benefit of stroke, benefit of heart disease, a heart healthy diet. There's some evidence that a heart healthy diet might uh, decrease your risk of developing uh, Alzheimer's. We're not clear on that yet, but it's certainly going to decrease your risk of stroke, decrease your risk of getting multi-infarct dementia, decrease your risk of getting a heart attack, right? Sleep. Um, you know, the sleep is, is, uh, uh, is something that's been associated with potentially um, having more problems later in life. Now, on the other hand, not getting enough sleep is clearly can impact things like uh, stroke, depression, and other things. So getting sleep, that's an easy thing to do and your quality of life will get better. Physical activity, which has now been proven um, to, even in cancer actually, the cancer, there have been studies in cancer that people who uh, do in randomized trial, do more physical activity, live longer with the same diagnosis of cancer than people that do less physical activity. But again, physical activity impacts your uh, health in, in other ways significantly with regards to stroke, heart disease, and many other things. And, and, and then the other things are really like running a, 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 a broken record. Control your blood pressure, monitor your medications, drink alcohol in moderation. Um, and so those are the things that we really can control. And now specifically what I probably, you know, I haven't talked about, and this is probably some certain, certain things you may have heard from colleagues. And again, these have not been proven across uh, validated studies, um, but there are some studies, and again, not enough that, you know, the NIH can come out and say this is what everyone should be doing. But there's a reasonable amount of evidence as uh, that people who maintain social connections, friends, networks, as they get older, tend to have a, a decreased risk of developing some of these dementia syndromes. Now, is it like chicken or egg? The people that don't have the syndromes uh, are the ones that do maintain the social connections. We, those are the things that, why it makes uh, these recommendations difficult to make. Now, um, and then the other thing that, that um, again, I think this addresses a lot of the questions, well, not, not completely, but you, know, you see a lot of ads on TV of you know, doing, buying certain games that you can do to stimulate your mind. Um, it, they may help, it's not entirely clear, but if you ask uh, the colleagues, uh, colleagues of mine in neurology that do research in this, and, and again, I actually asked uh, the other day as someone that um, does research in this, really the, the thing that he's convinced most about is that it's not so much one or two or three particular activities that you practice on that will prevent you from getting neurodegenerative disease. It's more about the variety. So doing one thing over and over again will get you really good at doing that one thing over and over again. But it's more about doing different things, new talents, just being creative, um, reading different things, the, the different types of material, uh, those are the things that, um, that some researchers believe have a bigger impact than doing certain things repetitively over and over again. Um, so again, but I personally think it's more uh, effective to focus on the things that you can potentially control that also impact your overall health and risk of other diseases, which are actually much more common. Um, and again, so if you want to go, the, the NIH does have guidelines, they have a website, you just have to type in NIH stroke or NIH you know, brain or NIH brain health. These, these websites are all there and they're actually quite uh, patient friendly. So with that, um, I'll shift to brain tumors, which is my, my specialty for myself and Dr. Golfinos, for here, here, who you'll hear about next, and, uh, or you hear from next. And, um, uh, you know, it'll be a relatively uh, focused general talk 
uh, about brain tumors, but mostly I'll describe what in general brain tumors are and generally how we treat these, okay? Um, and the start of this slide is that these are complex diseases that we really require multidisciplinary care. These are all team members that every single patient uh, has that has a brain tumor that has uh, involved with um, in order to treat their brain tumor appropriately. Um, and I'll go through uh, some of these individually uh, to just sort of describe the stepwise process of how we treat a brain tumor patient. Um, when I talk about brain tumors, really we think in general of two kind of different types in, in, in general. So there are malignant brain tumors and benign brain tumors. Benign brain tumors are actually much more common, um, but malignant brain tumors are, are malignant, and, and in general, most malignant brain tumors are still uncurable. And um, so I'll go into briefly into these. So the three most common uh, malignant brain cancers in adults are, is something called glioblastoma. Many of you probably heard about it now. There have been some high-profile people that have been diagnosed and constantly sort of in the news. Uh, glioblastoma um, is a malignant brain cancer. It's very, it's, of all the brain, malignant brain cancers that we see in adults, this is actually the most common. Um, there are also lower grades, but still considered malignant, gliomas, which are sort of a cousin of these glioblastomas, but they grow a bit slower. But by far the most common overall uh, brain cancer. So uh, when, when, I say, when I said glioblastoma is the most common brain cancer, it's the most common one that starts in the brain. But people who have cancer in the brain, the, by far the most common uh, cancer that we see in the brain are cancers that come from other parts of the body. So like breast cancer, lung cancer, very common cancers that then can spread and they spread into the brain. These brain, and we call them brain metastasis, they're about 10 times more common than, than these other brain cancers that start in the brain themselves, okay? There are, the benign tumors are, um, there are a number of benign tumors that by, uh, the, the most common here is meningioma. And meningioma is also probably something that many of you have heard about. And these are tumors that arise sort of on the skin around the brain, okay? Um, they're benign, but sometimes these can become uh, uh, refractory to the treatments that we have, and then we have to take complicated measures to treat them. But for the most part, these are generally benign tumor. Something called an acoustic neuroma that's also, or vestibular schwannoma, that's also relatively common. And there are tumors of the pituitary gland. This is a gland deep within the brain. Um, and these are, these are of, uh, of the bra uh, benign brain tumors, these are somewhat common brain tumors. Um, and so what are the signs and symptoms of a brain tumor? So many of the same signs and symptoms of stroke are the same as brain tumor, but the difference is the timing. So strokes happen suddenly, whereas brain tumors happen less suddenly, essentially. Typically weeks, sometimes months, and sometimes even years for the very slow growing ones. Um, but the classic presentation is someone over the past, somewhere between two to six weeks, notices that they have had progressively more weakness of their right arm. And it's progressive, meaning it's not like, you know, a little bit weak and then the next day is totally fine and then four days later it's weak and then the next day is totally fine. And it's sort of this progressive weakness until finally they want to get evaluated. Um, they can also call it, cause seizures and seizures are sudden and seizures are those things where you see people shaking. Um, they can be generalized where everyone, uh, where all, all the arms and legs are shaking or it could just be focal where it's just one arm that's shaking, okay? Um, so these are the signs and symptoms of a brain tumor. Again, um, the, the key here is the focality, meaning it's just one part of the body. But the difference between a stroke is the timing. The timing, the stroke happens quickly. It happens right away. Uh, with a brain tumor, the, the symptoms tend to happen over several weeks. Um, and then how do we treat these tumors? So again, as I mentioned, it's very complex sort of uh, team-based treatment for these tumors, but it starts out with in general, imaging to see if we can identify the brain, uh, brain tumor. So typically an MRI of the brain. Patients often go to surgery, almost always, but not always, go to surgery. And then we get a diagnosis, what we call it, a tissue diagnosis. We get a piece of tissue. Traditionally, it's been looking under the microscope, but really now we're moving towards doing a much more what we call molecular and DNA-based analysis, which gives us really a true identity of this tumor. And then from that information, we make a number of treatment decisions on what to do for this patient. And I'll um, go through that in general. So, uh, by, uh, so just to make an example of how we uh, use MRI, MRI kind of helps us identify what's in the brain, what, what the, where the tumor is, where it's localized, but also we're getting an, uh, more and more sophisticated to the point 
where now with some of these MRI techniques, we're actually able to accurately diagnose a tumor based on just uh, uh, sometimes a conventional MRI. And there's, this is just one example, something called a T2 flare mismatch. When we see this sign on an MRI, it actually gives us a diagnostic uh, information as this is a very specific type of tumor driven by very specific DNA alterations. Um, but uh, to, to uh, um, continue with that topic is that the DNA alterations are really starting to define how we think about these tumors. So what we do here is, here's the tumor here, this sort of dark area in the frontal lobe. After uh, Dr. Golfinos does the surgery and takes the tumor out, what we do is grind up that piece of tissue, isolate the DNA, essentially put in some of these sophisticated analyzers, and what you see here in the bottom is it really just tells us what the tumor is. Um, and, and there's complex algorithms that do that. And so this is where the field is really moving towards, giving us a much more accurate diagnosis of these tumors. And then once, uh, again, uh, uh, to Dr. Golfinos to talk a lot more about the surgery, but often the first part of the process is to get a surgery um, to treat that brain tumor. And he'll talk about that. Another part of the uh, process for most brain tumor patients and brain cancer patients, not all, but most, is, is radiation, radiation therapy. And, and um, these are just some images of, uh, of one, some of the modalities that we do for radiation. It's actually quite complex, but we do radiation generally just to a focal area around the tumor. Um, and there's complex planning and there's very specific physicians, radiation oncologists that do the, the radiation for these tumors. And then um, there's other spe more specified uh, types of radiation, something you might have heard about um, in, in, through others, uh, something called like gamma knife, um, uh, radio surgery, uh, cyber knife. These are all uh, different methods of, to apply the radiation. Again, um, just uh, these are different ways that we can apply the radiation to treat many different kinds of brain tumors. These are all different um, complex uh, ways that we do team-based care. And then finally, many of you are uh, familiar with chemotherapy. So chemo is a very general term. And uh, what, what we knew as chemo in the 80s and 90s has really morphed into many different things today. Um, you've probably heard now on TV or through your colleagues about immunotherapy, which uh, uh, is a, highlights an example of what we consider chemotherapy. So chemotherapy is now really just any medical therapy that's directed against the tumor. But immunotherapy is a very, very different type of, of therapy, medical therapy, than you can inject immunotherapy. You can inject into immunotherapy in the tumor. You can inject it in the vein. You can um, uh, uh, va use a vaccine that's like a type of an immunotherapy. So in any case, uh, any kind of medical therapy that's directed against the tumor is something we call the uh, chemotherapy now. Um, and then all cancer patients really require supportive care, supportive oncology, and that's a critical arm because, and particularly for patients with brain tumors, because patients with brain tumors, we've just talked a lot about cognitive impairment and weakness and things like that. Many patients with brain tumors have those things that really depend on uh, support services, either through provided to the hospital or through their friends and, friends and family um, to in, enable them to get through the care that they're getting. And we have integrated uh, uh, cancer care groups here uh, at the Perlmutter Cancer Center to, to support that. Um, and I'll just finish, I have a couple more slides and really just to highlight, most brain cancers are still lethal. And this, what this uh, slide shows you in blue is basically the, the amount of cancers there are for each one of these types. And then in red is for each one of these cancer types, the people that actually die from that cancer. So prostate, for example, is the longest blue. It's much more co the most common type of cancer. But in red, very few patients actually die from their prostate cancer. Um, uh, relatively, all right. So, so breast uh, is is very much the same. We notice here and uh, down below, brain is relatively rare. The blue uh, line is relatively rare, but um, the red is nearly to the level of the blue. And there's very few cancers left where most patients who have brain cancer still die from their brain cancer. So, a lot more, to, a lot more to go to to help patients with these tumors. Um, this is an example. These are widely infiltrative tumors, so all the white hazy stuff here, these are all brain tumor cells infiltrating throughout the brain, and that's one of the major problems with this disease. And so therefore, I think I just have one or two more slides, but what we really need is research. Um, we need to develop newer therapies, and that's what we do at high-level brain tumor centers. Um, like ours is it, we, we take excellent care of patients and we do this multidisciplinary care with radiation oncologists, supportive oncologists, and things like that. But really in order to advance 
the outcomes for this disease. We need those people that are treating these patients also to, to be involved in research to develop new therapies, to test new therapies for that, uh, for what they have. So we do test in clinical trials, um, non-interventional clinical trials. Clinical interventional meetings, we're actually giving you something. Non-interventional meaning we're studying cancer patients, but maybe just drawing their blood or looking at their quality of life and things like that. And we do a lot of lab research here to understand how these tumors develop and maybe in testing new drugs against them. Um, and so uh, with that, I'll just end with a summary. Um, again, so of, in terms of brain health in general, there are things that we fear and then there's things that are much more common um, that we should be fearing, right? So um, stroke uh, and, and um, uh, problems associated with stroke and other general medical con conditions that affect your cognition are much more common than actual Alzheimer's disease. And the, not only that, there are things that you can actually do to prevent or lower your risk of developing these. So know the signs and symptoms of stroke, know the measures that you can take to prevent stroke, um, know the different causes of things that can cause cognitive impairment. It's not just Alzheimer's disease. Actually, of all the things that can cause it, all that whole group is more common than Alzheimer's disease as a neurologist probably five times more common and just off the top of my head of all the different consults I see, all those things are much more common reasons than someone that actually has uh, dementia. And then um, talk to your doctor, go to these websites, get a little bit more information about what you can do. And the last thing I'll say about brain tumor centers is really these are relatively rare, but because they're rare and because again the cancers that develop are still very lethal, they really require high level multidisciplinary integrated brain tumor centers where they do take care of patients using all of these disciplines, but also uh, are involved in uh, research to try to identify new drugs and implement those new therapies uh, right away. So with that, um, thank you for your attention.